Microsoft reported earnings after the market closed today, and the stock was trading down by as much as 6%. Now, while it has recovered some of that, this reinforces a narrative that's going on on Wall Street right now, which is when will it stop? When will the spending on the infrastructure for AI stop? Let's dig into the company's quarter to try and figure out what management had to say about that. <clears throat> My name is Brian Stoffel. At the time of this recording, I do not own shares of Microsoft, and I want to give a shout out to FinChat.io for sponsoring today's video. So this was actually Microsoft's fourth quarter of fiscal 2024. It's about a $3.1 trillion company. Now, on the top line, revenue grew 15% and came in slightly ahead of Wall Street's estimates. The company guides for its three major categories, productivity and business, intelligent cloud, which includes Azure, and personal, more personal computing. On productivity and business and intelligent cloud, which are its two most important segments, the company met estimates there with uh, growth coming in at 11 and 19% respectively. More personal computing, however, growth was 14%, so it actually beat those estimates. On the bottom line, uh, earnings per share came in slightly ahead of estimates. Uh, it should have been 295 is what they had and 293 was the estimate. Either way, pretty good results right there. Now, when we turn to margins, it kind of, we flip the page a little bit and the, the, the results here are not quite as happy. Gross margins were down to now crossing below 70%. Operating margins ever so slightly down. Net margins were down more. Free cash flow jumped a not insignificant amount of about uh, $3.5 billion. Net income was up less, but still up. The balance sheet, if you include the short-term debt that the company has, is still healthy. They've still got a net cash position over $20 billion, but they have taken on more debt as of late than they have had in the recent past. Now let's go down the income statement to just see what the different dynamics are at play. Total revenue is up 15% but the cost of that revenue is up 17%. So whenever you've got revenue growing slower than the cost of that revenue, that's not a good thing. A big part of this is the build out of the AI infrastructure, which by necessity makes the cost of offering that through tools on Azure and cloud tools go up. That's why gross margin was up less than revenue. That's why I coded it red. Now it is worth pointing out that operating expenses, which is research and development, sales and marketing, overhead, that was only up 13%. That's less than revenue. That's a good thing why it's coded green. You add all those things together and you actually end up with the draw. 15% growth in revenue, 15% growth in operating income. Now net income was up by less 10%. A big part of that is because of this other income right here. That's less important to me overall. And it is worth stating that the number of diluted shares outstanding was pretty much stagnant. Um, so that's good news as well. But what else happened? Excuse me, what else happened during the quarter? Well, let's head over to finchat.io for that. Now, if you click the link, the first one in the show notes below, you can use this tool for free. And if you want full functionality, then you can get a subscription using that link and get 15% off. It is a tool that I use every day. Let me show you how. So I go on over and I type in the ticker symbol up here and I go to this tab right here, segments and KPIs. Now, why do I do that? Because it shows me those three distinct business entities that I talked about. And if you look here, we've already got the numbers from June of 2024. So it's been less than three hours and all these numbers are already in, which is why FinChat is my uh, website of choice to digest this information. Now you see more personal computing, you've got intelligent cloud, and you've got productivity in business. This is where Windows and Office 365 is. It's pretty clear what the main driver is because if you go back to just even the end of 2020, 2020 all three of these were roughly on equal footing, but that's not the case anymore. The intelligent cloud, Azure being the main driver, is the most important segment. And that being the case, it is worth looking at growth rates. So if we look at productivity in business, its growth rate right now is at about 11%. We talked about this already. Um, the, the one that really, really matters is Azure came in at 19%, uh, which was right where management thought it would be. And we had a nice little surprise here from the more personal computing, which grew 14%. What else happened during the quarter? Well, I think it's also worth pointing out 
where operating income is because we need to know that these businesses are generating profits. And again, you can see here that while more personal computing has been relatively stagnant, this is the hardware, it's, it's the software and the cloud services that really drive profitability. And again, we see a lot to like here. Uh, we see productivity in business saw their operating income grow by about 19%. Now that's important because revenue is only up 11%. So with this up 19%, that means that their operating margins expanded in productivity and business. What about if we look at Azure? Well, let's pull that up. We'll pull up Intelligent Cloud and we'll see where the growth rates are there. Uh, sorry, I need to close these other ones. And so what we see here is, is that operating income for Azure was up sorry, for the intelligent cloud was up 31%. That's great because it was 19% growth overall uh, for the segment. So the operating margins are expanding there as well. So what it really shows is that it's it's the, it's the more personal computing where the margins are going uh, down. So it's just worth pointing out that that's where we're at for that segment. Let's head, uh, let's head then back over and look at what the company said moving forward. Number one, they said that the productivity and business segment in the first quarter of fiscal 2025 should grow 10 to 11 percent, intelligent cloud 18 to 20 percent, personal, more personal computing 9 to 12 percent. All of these were just a tick lower than they were in the previous quarter, which is to be expected. So no big surprises there. Analysts are expecting top line growth of 16 percent. If you add all this together, this guide is slightly lower than what analysts at the midpoint are, are hoping for and analysts are expecting 5% growth on the bottom line. Now, the conference call was really important. So for the full year, they didn't necessarily have revenue guidance. They did say that they will have double digit growth in revenue and earnings per share. So I'll say that again. They do expect double digit growth in revenue and earnings per share, which kind of matches with what Wall Street was estimating. But this is really probably the most important thing. And it's where the questions went almost immediately after the company uh, opened up to questions on their conference call. They said capital expenditure levels will exceed the previous year. So I'll say that again, capital expenditures will exceed the previous year. Now, let me show you why that matters by heading back on over to finchat.io. This is why it matters, because if we look at capital expenditures, which you can see by going to the cash flow statement and investing activities, and we pull up capital expenditures, and we want to do this on an annual basis. Right now, we're on a quarterly basis, so let's pull it up on an annual basis. You see that capital expenditures have been growing very fast. In fact, when you add in the numbers from today, it went from 28 billion in the previous year to over 44 billion this year. That's a lot of capital expenditures. And we have seen when companies have come out with earnings like Alphabet, AKA Google, like Meta in the previous quarter, and now with Microsoft, that the spending on AI is just sucking up all the money in the tech sector right now. It's why I've asked the question, Who's going to benefit from this other than NVIDIA and its like-minded chip makers? Because the bottom line is, is that's where most of the spend is going at this point. Now, management was careful to point out that they're only investing in this to match the demand that they see for it. And they also pointed out that they are balancing this by saying operating expenses. So research and development, sales and marketing and overhead costs are only supposed to be going up in the single digit. So that's how they're going to try and balance it because these capital expenditures are going to keep increasing. I would not be surprised to see them above $50 billion. I don't even know, perhaps between 50 and $60 billion in the year ahead. We'll have to wait and see a year from now. But the bottom line is, is this trend is not ending. The big tech companies are convinced that spending on this is the most important thing, even if they can't provide analysts with a clear understanding for how it will be profitable in the future. That's where the title for this video, the thumbnail came from, when will it stop? That's what Wall Street's asking. That's why the stock was trading down after earnings. Um, and it's a wait and see game right now. We, we need to see if they can be profitable. So what should investors watch moving forward? Well, first and foremost are those capital expenditures. But the next two are really important too. The first is 
the revenue growth in the intelligent cloud, because that's where the revenue growth will most likely show up because of the capital expenditures. And what are the margins, the operating margins for the intelligent cloud that will show you if these capital expenditures are worth it. Management went, went out of their way to say that these capital expenditures will help us monetize for the next 15 years. I don't know if I'm buying that, but they clearly understand what Wall Street analysts are worried about. And finally, number four, keep an eye on free cash flow. I still think the thesis is on track for owning this, although I don't own this stock myself. So take that with a grain of salt. The next question then becomes, how does it score on my framework? It gets an 11. But the final question is, what about valuation? And for that, we can go back to finchat.io. And so if we look at this, we see a company that is still richly valued. It's got about a 36, a PE of 36 right now, a price to free cash flow, uh, if I can pull it up here, of about 45. That's way more expensive than the company has been at any point over the recent history. And it is very expensive on an absolute basis. What about if we're looking forward? Do those numbers get any better? Well, let's look at the company's forward PE ratio, which is only a little bit better at 33. And as you can see, is quite expensive. And finally, we can look at the company's forward price to free cash flow ratio of about 46. Again, this is elevated. So pretty much any way you cut this, this looks quite expensive. The last thing we could do is look at a reverse discounted cash flow analysis to see what we think. So for this, we type in the company's ticker symbol. We put in its trailing free cash flow, which as of this most recent report is roughly $74.1 billion. Yes, over the past year, they've generated over $74 billion in free cash flow. We'll give them a normal terminal growth rate, 10% discount rate. And I believe the stock price is down to roughly $405, $408. So we want to make these two match. And if we bring it up to 17% or 18%. So what we're looking at is the, the company needs to grow its free cash flow by about 18% per year over the next 10 years to justify the stock price. And so you can see why shares have been trading down after hours, but also trading down over the last few quarters. The bottom line is, is that this company is still in very, very solid shape. There is no doubt about that. The question becomes about valuation because as you, as you saw on the PE and price to free cash flow ratio, this is not only elevated compared to the market, but it's elevated compared to the company's own history. And it needs to keep up almost 20% free cash flow growth per year to justify the stock price, although, although stock buybacks could bring that figure down a little bit. So what will I be doing as a shareholder? Will I be adding this to my portfolio? Well, probably not, but I also want to announce a new product that's going to be launching on September 1st called Stock Investing Mentor. And through this service, you will have full access to my portfolio as well as updates when I buy, sell, trim, or add to positions. But that's not all. You will also have weekly one hour live training sessions on topics throughout the investing spectrum where I can teach a new concept and you can ask questions and be a part of it and access to a private online investing community. Now that launches on September 1st. The second link in the show notes below will take you to a page. All you have to do is put your email in and you'll be put on the wait list. That's important because if you're on the wait list, you'll get access to a webinar that will kick this off and access to the largest potential discounts on a full year membership. So that's what I thought of Microsoft's fiscal fourth quarter of 2024 earnings. Let me know what you thought in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to check up on this in 90 days when they uh, record their next earnings. And until then, Brian.